Constant. I really hope you don't miss a week of this series. I'm going to give you the word of forgiveness today. Uh, and then next week, uh, I'm going to preach on, I'm really excited to preach on the word of assurance. Uh, it's a message I've wanted to give for uh, some time now. Everyone will leave here next week absolutely sure where you are going when you die. And the week after that, Pastor Tom is going to preach a powerful message on the word of love. And then Easter weekend, and Pastor Kelly will be back, and he'll give an extremely important message on the word of substitution. And I need to tell you about Easter weekend. We're going to be adding a service that weekend on Friday night. So for the sake of clarity, that's all the service times. Uh, But all we're really doing is adding one service uh, identical to the rest on Friday night. And we'd love for you uh, to come on that one. That's... Uh, When we've done that in the past, it's a really powerful time, really great way to kick off Easter weekend. But I hope you can join us for this season, for this series on the cross. And by join us, I don't mean just hear what we have to say. I mean join us in contemplating and being built up in the power of the cross of Jesus Christ. Because as we're going to sing at the end of this message, here our hope is found. Here on holy ground. Here, it's here that we bow down. If you need answers, you need the cross. And if you need peace or comfort, you need the cross. And if you need forgiveness, you need the cross. If you need a fresh start, if you need rest, if you need help, if you need to know that there's a God, if you need to be reminded that he loves you, if you need to be reassured of something, you need the cross. If you need to be shown or reminded of something, you need the cross. If you need to be challenged, maybe it's been a while since you worked at growing the roots of your faith, you need the cross. Why the cross? I mean, we sing about it almost every week. We talk about it at some point almost every single week. We've got a cross up on the wall. We've got a cross in the parking lot. We talk about the cross all the time. Do we really need seven weeks at the cross? And I'm going to let Jesus set up the answer to that question. Why the cross? And it's a passage of scripture where we find Jesus talking about his life, his death, his purpose and coming. And he's just used an illustration that his listeners didn't really understand. It was an illustration about sheep. And when you need to know that when Jesus picks an illustration, he sticks with it, man. I mean, he's going to just ride that illustration and milk it for all it's worth. So he picks this illustration or this metaphor, and they don't understand it, so he unpacks it. And we'll start it there. He says, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me were thieves and robbers. But the true sheep did not listen to them. Yes, I am the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. They will come and go freely and will find good pastures. The thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. But my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. A hired hand will run. When he sees a wolf coming, he will abandon the sheep, the sheep because they don't belong to him, and he isn't their shepherd. And so the wolf attacks them and scatters the flock. The hired hand runs away because he's working only for the money and doesn't really care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep, and they know me, just as my father knows me, and I know the father. So I sacrifice my life for the sheep. I have other sheep too that are not in the sheepfold. I must bring them also. They will listen to my voice, and there will be one flock with one shepherd. The Father loves me because I sacrifice my life so I may take it back again. Spoken like a real boss, no one can take my life from me. I sacrifice it voluntarily. For I have the authority to lay it down when I want to, and also to take it up again. For this is what my Father has commanded. So when we think about 
Jesus' sacrifice, when we look at him laying down his life voluntarily in our place, we do well to to think about the cross this way. To think about the cross as a doorway, not a destination. Meaning that whenever I approach anything in life or anything in faith, I need to walk through the doorway. I need to walk through the gate of Jesus on the cross. If you want what God has for you, if you want God's will for you, if you want God's plan for you, you've got to go through this narrow doorway called the cross of Jesus. If you want the Holy Spirit in your life, you've got to go through the doorway of the cross. Our worship is pleasing to God because God has reconciled us to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. If we want to live a rich and satisfying life, meaning a fulfilling life, a full life, a life that counts for something, we have to start looking at everything in our lives through the doorway of the cross and through this lens called the gospel. Because any benefit, any good and pleasing thing from God coming our way is, coming, is going to come our way because of this cross. So let's get to the first of the seven benefits that we're going to talk about in this series. Our statement from Jesus this week. And as it starts out here, he is carrying his own cross up the hill to be crucified. I'll walk walk through it with you. Luke 23, 32. Two others, both criminals, were led out to be executed with him. When they came to a place called the Skull, and that's what the word Golgotha or Calvary means. It's a hill in Jerusalem, and when you look at it, it looks like a human skull. And you could Google image it and see it. It, This mount uh, is in the center of Jerusalem now, but then it would have been on the outside of Jerusalem, outside the city. And they nailed him to the cross. And the criminals were also crucified, one on his right, And one on his left. Jesus said, and here's the first thing Jesus said from the cross, talking about the soldiers, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. And the soldiers gambled for his clothes by throwing dice. The crowd watched and the leaders scoffed. He saved others, they said. Let him save himself if he's really God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers mocked him too by offering him a drink of sour wine. They called out to him, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. Save yourself. Jesus was saving them. I mean, that's like if someone stepped in front of a bullet for you, would you say, if you're really a good person, you would save yourself? And the first word that Jesus gives from the cross frees us from guilt. As the first word is to God regarding the forgiveness about the people who are literally crucifying him. Father, forgive them for they don't know what they are doing. Guilt can be a crippling thing. It can be absolutely crippling. But there is no reason that any of us should walk out of here today still carrying guilt. Today is the day to let it go and to get it dealt with. And we try to deal with guilt on our own. And this isn't in your notes, but feel free to write this down somewhere in the margin. I want to give you three things that we usually do with our guilt. Number one is we bury it. Have you ever heard you've got to bury your past? The one problem with that, it doesn't stay buried. It keeps coming back in your dreams, in your thoughts, in your memories. It can resurrect itself at the most inappropriate time. And everyone has a favorite way to deal or to bury their past. And some people try to minimize it. Well, it's no big deal. It wasn't that big of a deal. Some people rationalize. A lot of other people have done this. And some people compromise. They just lower the standard. And they say it's not a sin anymore. It doesn't bother me anymore. Well, I used to think it's bad, but I don't really think it's bad anymore. The second way we try to deal with guilt is we blame others. And this tactic is as old as creation itself. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve sinned. And then Adam blamed God for giving him Eve. 
Proverbs 19.3 says people ruin their lives by their own foolishness and then are angry at the Lord. But the Bible calls Jesus the second Adam or the better Adam. And here's why. Adam was tempted and sinned. We were tempted and sinned. Jesus was tempted and did not sin. Adam sinned and blamed. We sinned and blamed. Jesus sacrificed. The first Adam blamed. The second Adam sacrificed. A third way we try to deal with our guilt is we beat ourselves up. And we subconsciously try to pay for our mistakes. You know, a guilty conscience can even make you sick. I mean, have you seen those studies? They come out every once in a while of how many sick people would be better tomorrow if they knew how to get rid of either resentment or guilt. Resentment, what other people have done to me, or guilt, what I've done to other people. And they can make you sick. And a lot of times people are sick and they think, I must be eating the wrong thing. And well, you may not be. You may need to correct what you eat. But I love how pastor says, he says, you may need to find out what's eating you. Because guilt and resentment can make you stressed out. They can make you have no energy. Can guilt cause depression? Absolutely. It's a form of atonement. Well, I've done the wrong thing, so I'll just make myself depressed. Can guilt sabotage success? Absolutely. Many people have sabotaged their own success because they thought, you know, I don't really deserve this. But you know what the problem is with punishing yourself? You don't know when enough's enough. And you don't know when to stop the punishment, so you just keep it on and on and on. And some of you are still beating yourselves up over something that happened years ago, five years ago, 15, as a kid. And you're still beating yourself up. And that's what we do with our guilt. But I want to look at what Jesus wants us to do with our guilt. And the, Bi- the Bible is very specific about how to get off a guilt trip. Uh, the steps are simple, but they're strong. They're not easy. And number one is admit it. And sometimes when we run from guilt, we try to run from it by keeping busy and we keep ourselves so busy, overworking. The reality is you can even do this in ministry. And a lot of people who are actively involved in ministry or they're serving, they do it for the wrong reason. They're running from their guilt. They're saying, I've done these wrong things. Now I'm going to make up for it. But that's not a good reason to serve God. It's not a good reason to serve another person. A lot of times we try to deal with our guilt by moving, like literally moving. Some people will move away or they'll change churches or they'll change friendships. They'll say, I blew it in a certain area, so I'm going to move away from that area. But that doesn't work. Proverbs twenty twenty seven says, the Lord gave us a mind and a conscience. We cannot hide from ourselves. That's why guilt is so devastating in your life. You can hide it from others, but you cannot hide it from yourself. 1 John 1.8, if we claim we have no sin, we're only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. You've got to admit it. And too many of us, we defeat ourselves because we deceive ourselves. So what are you pretending is not a problem in your life? What are you pretending is not really a habit? What are you saying? No, this isn't an addiction. It's not a problem. I can handle it. What are you pretending is not a problem? If I want to stop defeating myself, I've got to stop deceiving myself. Number two, I've got to accept responsibility. I'm not going to deal with your problem. I'm not going to deal with your sin. I'm going to deal with mine. So one day, King David As you probably know, he had a moral failure in his life. And one day he's looking out of his palace and he sees a beautiful, gorgeous woman bathing on a roof. And can I just ask a question here? I don't care what the culture was or how the buildings were set up. Is that really where you ought to be bathing? Knowing that the palace can look down on you? And when David saw her, it eventually led to adultery. And David, as you know, ended up having... Her husband murdered. And in Psalm 51, we get David's moral inventory. A confession of sin 
after his adultery with Bathsheba. And when we read it, it's powerful because he does not blame Bathsheba for even 1%. He takes it all on himself. He says, I recognize my rebellion and it haunts me day and night. Now, what is the best way to ensure that you have accepted responsibility for the dumb things you have done? Well, the best way to accept, accept responsibility is to tell one other person. We talk about this all the time here. You've got to find somebody who's going to be a friend, who's going to love you unconditionally. And everyone needs to find a person in their life like that, that you can admit your sins and your faults. In fact, God says that this is the essential key to letting go of guilt. And many of you have confessed your sins to God and you still feel guilty because you have not done this step. And you have confessed your sin to God over and over and over and over and you still feel guilty because you've never told another person. James 5.16 says, Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be Healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. So if you want to be forgiven, all you've got to do is confess it to God. If you want to be healed of the negative emotions, you need to tell another person. And if you say, well, I'm not going to do that, then you're deciding to carry the guilt with you the rest of your life. Why is it like that? It's simple. You need to write this down somewhere on your page. The root of all our problems is relational. The root of all of our problems is relational. You are reacting still to relationships in your life that you did not like. Today, you are still reacting to negative relationships. And those relationships may have been a long, long time ago, but they are still pushing you in a direction that you do not want to go. And this is why we say life change happens in the context of relationships. Because the root of every problem is negative relationships. We've been manipulated and we manipulate. We're all dishonest with each other. We play games, we wear masks, and we pretend. We're not only dishonest with God, but we're dishonest with each other. And it isolates us from each other. It causes fear. It creates insecurity. And we all need that one other person in our life that we can be totally honest with. It is God's way of freeing us. So I've got to admit it. I've got to accept responsibility. And here's the third one. I've got to ask for forgiveness. And this is where the cross gets really amazing because on the cross, the price of forgiveness was paid. The price of our forgiveness has already been paid, but we're going to need to come humbly through the doorway of Jesus Christ to receive that forgiveness. Now, there's a right way and a wrong way to ask for forgiveness. You can beg, oh God, please, 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 please. Like God is unwilling to forgive you. God, if you'll, you could bribe, I'll do anything. I'll go to Africa. And I've always felt so bad for Africa because I just envisioned that all the American Christians over there like got the short end of a bribe with God and they're just there because they bribed God and then they felt compelled to go. I don't know why we say Africa, but it's like if we go there, we pay for our sins. But you don't have to bribe God to forgive you. You don't have to beg. You don't have to tell him I'll never do it again. You don't have to say I'll tithe. I'll tithe 20%. You need to hear this. You need to understand this. The price has already been paid and he would love to forgive you. You need to ask. You just need to confess. Another word for confess in this translation would be to agree. Agree with God that this is wrong. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. 
Romans 3.23, for everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God with undeserved kindness declares that we are righteous. And he did this through Jesus Christ when he freed us from the penalty for our sin. And it really doesn't matter what you've done. What matters is what Christ has done. And the first thing he says from the cross is, Father, forgive them. So the first message of good news, this first word from the cross, is a word of forgiveness. And when you come to God humbly and honestly, believing in Christ, you are forgiven. And you may be saying, Ryland, I have done that. I've asked God over and over to forgive me, but I do not feel forgiven. Let me just say a couple things. You don't have to ask over and over, and I'm not trying to pile on the guilt here, but when you ask over and over, you're forgetting that the crucifixion already happened. And the problem is not God. The problem is you either haven't confessed it to another person, or it's false guilt from Satan. And you need to know what Jesus does with your guilt. Four things Jesus does with your guilt is he forgives instantly. Isaiah 55, 7, let the wicked change their ways and banish the very thought of doing wrong. Let them turn to the Lord that he may have mercy on them. Yes, turn to our God for he will forgive generously. And the myth is that feeling guilty makes me a better person. Feeling guilty does not make you a better person. God doesn't want you to walk around with guilt. It's unnecessary for holiness. Number two, God forgives completely. He forgives completely. He's not just quick and merciful to forgive. When Jesus died for your sins, he died for every sin, every one of them, even the ones that you haven't committed yet. They've been paid for By the cross of Jesus Christ. Colossians 2.13. You were dead because of your sins. And because of your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ. He forgave all our sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us. And took it away by nailing it to the cross. God forgives repeatedly. Have you ever committed the same sin more than once? Yes. But therefore he is able once and forever to save those who come to God through him. He lives forever to intercede with God on their behalf. Maybe you need to hear it this way. At the cross, God solved the problem of sin. He solved the problem of sin. If sending prophets would have solved the problem... He would have just done that. If giving us the Ten Commandments would have solved it, he would have just done that. If giving us the law would have done it, he would have just done that. If if I could get it right, the cross didn't need to happen. If I could live a perfect life, Jesus would not have died. Thank God, I thank God every day that he is able once and forever to save me. And that he lives forever to intercede with God on my behalf. you got to know that when you come to God asking for forgiveness, he already knows that you couldn't get it right. Number four, God forgives freely. You don't earn it. You don't deserve it. It's a gift of God's grace. Because you are human, forgiveness is your greatest need. And because Christ died for you, forgiveness is God's greatest gift. Ephesians 1, 7, He is so rich in kindness and grace that He purchased our freedom with the blood of His Son and forgave our sins. I don't beg for it. I don't bargain for it. I don't bribe. I believe. And here's the bottom line. Sin is is not simply doing something a bad way. It's doing something your own way. 
So every time I do something my own way and ignore God's way, it is sin. And it may look good on paper, and it may not always feel bad, and culture might not say it's bad, and it may not look bad to our world, and it may seem right to me, but if it's not God's way, it's wrong. It's sin. And sin has a penalty, and that penalty is death. And somebody has to pay for your sins. And people think hell is a place where people go that God is mad at. No, hell is a place that people go to pay for their sins. Or we could believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and get into heaven on his payment for our sins. And when we believe, the Bible says he has removed our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. I want to close with a video. It's a video of a galaxy. And it's the Andromeda galaxy. And it's a neighboring galaxy to ours. And it's ten times farther away than the farthest stars in our galaxy. It's 220,000 light years in diameter with a trillion stars. Now, I'm going to show you this video, and I could give you more stats, but the video speaks for itself. And I need to warn you that you're going to go 220,000 light years in about two minutes. So if you get motion sick, I get dizzy watching this thing. So I don't know what you got to do, but it's so powerful. To, it's too powerful not to show you this. So just remember, every white dot that you see is a star. So when God wanted to illustrate how far your sins have been removed from you, he told us as far as the east is from the west. And he built a universe to show you just how far that is. I mean, we're not talking St. Louis to Denver here. It's so far that if you even wanted to go on a guilt trip, you wouldn't make it. You couldn't get there. Let's pray together. Would you bow your head? God, we bow our hearts and our lives at the cross tonight. It is indeed where our hope is found. We put all our hope in you. It's through Jesus' powerful name we pray. Amen.